Hi, Karen. Thanks so much for joining us on the 25th episode of Z Talks. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. And we're excited to have you. So I wanted to start out by asking you if you could tell us a little bit about your backstory and what got you to where you are here today. I always like to say that my current position as a business owner is a culmination of everything I did in the past. You know, I graduated with a biology degree, worked myself up in corporate America, went back and got my MBA, further, you know, advanced in corporate America. All throughout that time, I was doing social activism. I was leading the employee resource group for African-American employees. I was sitting on the board um, here with a local organization in Inglewood, California. So all those things, whether it's the science, the FDA background, caring about our people, all those things led up to me taking a trip uh, to Ghana. And while I was there, really had my eyes opened around the cocoa industry, what really is going on behind the scenes. And even though I had my eyes open, it was really more about what could I do? What more could I do to partner with Ghana? And I learned that, you know, Ghana was a thriving country. Charity wasn't necessarily what they needed. There are people that need charity, just like there's people here in the U.S. But what what other way could I partner with Ghana? And it was during my trip to the Slave Coast Castle, which is in, in Ghana, where you get to experience the last place where slaves were kept before they actually were part depart for the Americas. Okay. And during that time, I literally had like a transformative experience, like how do we get in this situation? What piece can I, you know, what role can I play to help us get out of this situation? And I really was resolved to do something And chocolate was one of the easier things because they had the best tasting chocolate. And and the disparity didn't make sense to me. It was, there's a disparity between what the cocoa farmers are making and the billion dollar revenues that companies are bringing in. Like, it doesn't make sense. Why, Why are the cocoa farmers making pennies? So all of that research culminated in me creating Canda Chocolates. Wow, there's, there's so much to unpack there. And so when you said what got us into that situation, what, what did you mean? Like how to get us out of that situation, you said. What, what situation were you referring to? So even though, you know, that Ghana's, you know, been out of colonialism for some time, it's not enough time, right? So while we were free out of slavery, right, we still had Jim Crow, things like that going on here in the United States. Well, they didn't get out of the colonialism until in the mid 1900s. So that being said, it wasn't that long ago. And when they got out of colonialism, they had debt that they owed. And then China, you know, we're thankful to China in some ways, China came back around and bought the debt. They said, we'll finance you, we'll allow you to become your own country. Well, to this day, Ghana does a lot of business and owes a lot of money to China. In fact, it came up during President Obama's uh, presidency that they wanted him to pay off their debt. Like, did we have the ability to pay off Ghana's debt? Because that's, you know, Mm -hmm. how do we fix this situation? So that didn't happen, but it was proposed. And so another way to do it is to is look at ways to continue to help generate money. And so generating money is exporting finished chocolate contributing to jobs in Ghana, which is what I do, and then also paying a fair wage to Ghanaian cocoa farmers. And that's just scratching the surface. Um, and, you know, until I become some multi-billionaire company, you know, it's scratching the surface, but it's it's setting an example and it's and it's leading the way. Yeah. That's that's amazing. So glad to hear how you're contributing to this, you know, problem that's in Ghana right now and just getting them to be self-sustaining. Wondering though, what you said before founding Canda, Canda Chocolate. Am I saying it correctly? Mm-hmm, but I, but I welcome everyone that I'm not a stickler, so it's Canda Chocolates. But I Canda. welcome everybody to say it, Canda Panda, whatever. But you can say it any way that you want to. Canda, it's okay. Canda Chocolate. You were you were talking about your contribution that Canda Chocolate is making to Ghana, uh, but you also said prior to founding the company, you were a social activist. So what motivated you? Like, what was the story behind your um, enthusiasm for being a social advocate? Gosh, I want to answer with the two second answer and saying being born black. But uh, (laughs) to give a little bit more to that, I mean, honestly, I mean, I have pictures of me in the in the parade in high school, Black Student Union. When I was at college at KU, I was chair of the the Black Student Union. So I just... There's never been a time where I wasn't like, hey, y'all, 
We got to fight for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Only, only people that are going to fight for us is us. And hey, y'all, we got to do this. Um, I grew up. I will say, uh, if people do a back history story on me, you mm-hmm. may find an Oprah video, um, and I'll make this story short. Okay, but, you are Oprah? Yep, to thank my teacher. Okay. I was in the second grade in Troy, Michigan. I was the only brown child there, and Oprah pulled, picked up on that story, so I got to thank my teacher. What was significant is that when I got to the school, I was called names for the difference of the color of my skin. And that teacher really helped me to overcome it. You know, the friends that I made, all that stuff, people that weren't able to see the difference. What's crazy is when I went from second grade to third grade, they had to ask the same teacher to split a split class, to teach a split class, because other teachers didn't know what to do with me in their classes. Wow. Mm-mm. Right. So then she split the class. So even though it was like an honors class, after that, my parents transferred me to a private school. That teacher still came to all my performances. I still talk to that teacher to this day. Um, She is not a black woman, but she was supportive, understanding, had her own experiences when she went away to school and it allowed her to see me as a human being and just one of her students, as opposed to everybody else seeing me for the color of my skin. So I I have an idea that that may have been something that catapulted me to say, you know, I think growing up in a community where I was the only one it said to me, I want to embrace being Black even more so, and I don't have to take this. And I'm going to seek my people out, and I'm going to you know, uplift my people as much as possible, as often as possible. So mm-hmm. I, I'm pretty sure that's probably where some of it begins. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a very early childhood experience, very formative. I, I, I don't doubt you. It's interesting. I'm from Detroit, so I know exactly where Troy, Michigan oh, is. Okay, yes. Yeah, yes. surprising, though, that it's so close that, you know, it's probably like 20 minutes from Detroit that you would yeah. have that experience. Um, but yeah, glad that you were able to vocal- vocalize that and shed light on that and, and by being on Oprah. <laughs> Congratulations, yeah. by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I wanted to talk to you about your company. So I know you have candy chocolate but on your website you also also mentioned sage and elms you mm-hmm. also mentioned sage and elms and so can you talk about sage and elms and how it fits into canda yeah i can so for anyone that's thinking about starting a business um i'm telling my story but i also am going to tell you that i did this because i have dreams of becoming multifaceted billion dollar business with different brands underneath it so i'll start with that But Sage and Alms is just the parent company. It's a benefit corporation that will hold the brand Canda Chocolates. And I came up with the name, and this is important for me. I wanted to have a business that was, you know, environmentally conscious, social justice conscious, um, but also giving back to others. And so Alms, A-L-M-S, means to give to the poor in every religion. And, I, and the word just sticks with me. And, and, and so much so where it came from for me was that my mother's name, middle name, and her mother's name is Alma, A-L-M-A. And so the shortened version was alms. And then I said, alms means to give to the poor. That's exactly what I want to do. And then sage means to bring in wisdom. And, you know, it's more of a comforting wisdom. Sage wisdom is more like someone sitting around a fire and sharing what they've learned from our ancestors, right? That's what sage gives you the feeling of. And so I came up with the term sage and alms. And then we give back 10% of our proceeds back to charitable organizations. And it sits as a as that umbrella and that reminder to myself that should I decide to create, you know, Karen snacks, you know, next I can because I can create many different brands underneath a parent company name. That's such an awesome story and almost seems meant to be, you know, I'm struggling right now with how do I get back. So your, your story is inspirational to me and I'm sure a lot of people out there will res- it will resonate with them as well. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So on the website, and we talked a little bit about this, you said you're a servant leader. Why do you think it's so important to get back to your community? You know, if, if not us, then who, you know, is one of my things around that. Um, Servant leadership though, I think is for me, and I coined the term from MLK and for anyone, any ancestors that came before him, it's really about more, it's about, even if I was in corporate America, 
Am I leading a team to tell them what to do? Or am I leading a team to ask them what do they need? Two different types of leaders. And so always, I've always wanted to be the type of leader, whether it was giving back or not, that says, how can I serve you? How can I help you? And it's ingrained in me. And it's important because I just, again, back to what I started with, if not me, if not us, then who? It's like, I know that people helped me and I know that I want to be able to help others. And if I, and if I don't, then, then what am I doing here? What is my purpose? So just going back to my relationship with God and we talk about our God-given purpose, my purpose is to serve others. That is my purpose here on this earth. And so any way that I can be of service, whether that's helping, whether that's giving advice or whether that's donating, all of that falls underneath that, that, that whole umbrella of being a servant leader. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, as we start a new year, I know everyone's thinking about the purpose and what's my purpose, what does it all mean? So it's it's great, awesome that you figured that out <laughs> already because I know a lot of people are struggling with that. So congratulations on that. Um, Thank I also, you. And I, do, mm -hmm. I just want to say, you know, even though I know that's my overarching purpose, we start over the year and we ask ourselves, okay, what are my goals? What's my purpose? What job do I want? You know, all these things. And throughout this pandemic, and with all that we've talked about with regards to mental health, um, even though I know I have a purpose, right, that doesn't mean that I, that I know that everything I'm doing aligns perfectly with that purpose is what I should say. And so when I say that, I give a lot of um, grace for people to go through a process and to experiment and find out what brings them joy and purpose and that you may find something that gives you joy and purpose for a little while and then you have to move to the next thing so i guess what i'm blanketing all this to say is grace like if if people are kicking off that new year with you know what's my vision board what are my goals hey if you're that person kudos to you but if you're not that person and you're struggling and you're like man last year was hard i was just trying to you know just trying to make it trying to make it trying to survive then give yourself some grace, right? And, and it's not about that. And that just spend the time relaxing, self-care and experimenting and then going through the process. So I just, anytime somebody brings that up, I have to say it now because we, me and my tribe are going through it. We are going through it. It's real life. And um, I'm just blessed and happy to be here. So, yeah. And that's a good lead into the next question because it seems like we're, we're going through a, a never ending COVID season. How has it impacted your business? COVID has impacted my business in both positive and negative ways. And I, and I want to make sure I share both, right? And I'll, you know, starting with the negative and most recently, you know, I actually went through almost the whole year and a half of COVID without any supply issues. And then I decided to switch up an ingredient. And the next thing you know, it was like five months later, a customer ordered something and I couldn't even get it to them for five months because the whole process was broken down. So I wasn't impacted, you know, as largely as others, but now I have experienced it. And it was very painful, you know, sales lost, all those different things because you don't have the inventory to give to people. So the pandemic has had, you know, that has been a, a sad impact, but where I picked up in positive ways, I've become more nimble as a business owner. And it caused me to pivot. You know, it's the word that we're using for all the businesses, but everybody had to pivot. I, I leaned more on e-commerce. And in doing so, it brought me all these opportunities, right? That's how I ended up in USA Today, Vanity Fair, speaking. All that came from me going mm -hmm. into, you know, Amazon. And Macy's wouldn't have picked me up until Amazon had me on their platform and Amazon was back, you know, backing me. So all that stuff came from me saying, wait a minute, I can't just rely on a retail store. I got to go on to e-commerce and push harder and change my offering. So, you know, there was the negative and then there was that, you know, that pressure that forced me to, you know, you know, compact and, and combust and become something else and bring out that real diamond that allowed me to shine. So definitely some positives, definitely some lows. Um, it definitely had its impact, but I would say that if businesses were able to have either neutral or thriving, you know, revenues, then they too possibly had some positive impacts from COVID. 
Yeah, it's like sink or swim. And if you're still here, that's a good sign. That's a good, that's good news. Yeah. And it actually it just made me remember when it's the last time I interacted with you on online was when I saw a post about Amazon. So can you tell us a little oh. bit about your Amazon adventures and experience? Wow. Amazon, you know, yeah. The blessings upon blessings upon blessings. Cue the Drake song. Blessings on blessings for me and my from the six. Look at what we did. Okay. Somebody add that in. But seriously, it has been a lot of blessings, you know, from getting on there. I've been working with a public relations person over there at Amazon. They, you know, found my product and definitely wanted to get me more involved. And every time I'd get involved, it'd be one thing after the other. So started off with women's his, you know, history month. Then it ended up being a June push for what everybody else uses as prime day. Then I ended up you know, speaking with Black Girl Magic um, for a summit. Then I was on Amazon Accelerate. Then I you know, went and visited the Seattle offices and had a tour. You know, From there, that's the Vanity Fair. That's the USA Today and everything else that has come from it. So a lot of publicity. My face is on their website. So if you go there, you'll see me. Um, I'm also on the Hello Alice website where a lot of people go to get uh, funding. So you'll see me there. And I started yeah. off in the pilot program for the Amazon Black Business Accelerator, and then they actually launched it. So I was in the program before they even titled it, and I was a part of the pilot program to give feedback on kind of how this program could be shaped. So, so many things came out of Amazon. You said it right. Blessings upon blessings. Yes. That is amazing. But you know what it made me think of is I've heard the phrase, I grew too fast. Did, did you experience any of that by the intense exposure that you got from Amazon, USA Today, and the others that you mentioned? I didn't, honestly. I mean, meaning, I, meaning I wish I did. I grew, I grew enough to sell through the inventory that I had, right? And so as long as, as long as I'm keeping up with demand, as long as I didn't exhaust myself, and it allowed me to grow into getting, you know, warehouse help and things like that. So I would say no. Um, if it had been another platform, maybe, you know what I mean? Like, so when you get ready to go into the bigger big box stores, then yeah, you probably, you know, there's probably like some like, hey, did you experiment at this level? But Amazon allowed me to make mistakes, get customer feedback, to change based on the customer feedback. So that's the thing you don't get out of a big box store all the time is the opportunity to interact and kind of make changes based on what your customers are seeing. So that's the benefit that I got out of working with Amazon. This is not an ad. This is like real talk. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you, I mean, you essentially just said it in a nutshell what the beauty of digital is. And I, I just was talking to a client about this. It's that it's, you can reach people at scale, mm -hmm. but it's also very measurable. And that's, that's what led me to digital is I'm an engineering undergrad, but I love the fact that, you know, I'm engineering, I'm MBA marketing. But I love the fact that I could measure stuff with digital. And, and that's the beauty. You can test and learn. So congratulations on that. I'm sure it's made a huge impact on your Macy's, your in-store Macy's. So. But um, I also wanted to ask you, because um, we're 20 minutes in the conversation, a, a little bit over 20 minutes, and we haven't talked so much about Canda. We talked a little bit, but I wanted to, wanted to make sure the audience knows what Canda chocolate is. So can you give us a brief overview? Yeah, absolutely. So I shared that I was in Ghana. While I was there, I tasted the chocolate and it, it didn't have that typical bitter taste. And I started asking questions and, you know, not to go too far into the history and all this about cocoa, but what you should know is just as the same where people go different places for coffee and it tastes different, coffee has 800 different tasting notes. Well, chocolate or cocoa has 600. And so where you grow your cocoa, the soil, the water, just like you have, I mean, I know I go to these Italian restaurants and they're like, we imported our water to cook this meal for you from Italy. Like they think it makes a difference. And it does, these things do take, you know, affect the taste buds, if you will. And so cocoa grown in Ghana is creamier, more cocoa forward. And so you're just going to get a different flavor out of Ghana produced cocoa. And so I was drawn to it, wanted to create Canada chocolates, shared with you, you know, what led me to do it. I still thought I was crazy to take on the giants. Like, why would I enter the chocolate business? This isn't anything, you know, I'm going from healthcare to chocolate. How did this happen? Um, but I was really yeah. drawn to the taste and I went in and started talking to buyers and I said, let's talk about chocolate. 
And they're like, oh, we can't keep it on the shelf. If it's in store, people buy chocolate and they buy different kinds of chocolate. So the chocolate is a business looked up from an analytical perspective. It had a growth margin that was going to go on for the next five years. And interestingly enough, during COVID, uh, we didn't even see that downturn. Co chocolate was like alcohol. People, it was a comfort item. You know, I, I'd rather you turn to chocolate than alcohol, but either way, maybe mix both. I don't know. But um, so it wasn't something that was going down. So I launched my business. But the, the platform of Canda Chocolates, if I lost anyone along that part of the story, here's the most important part to keep, is that the chocolate is grown in Ghana, processed in Ghana. So there's people in Ghana that are manufacturing it, putting it into the chocolate bar and packaging it before it comes to the United States. That is the difference between myself and the competitors. That's what gives more money to Ghana versus just like send me these send me this cocoa beans for pennies and I'm not going to pay you what you want to be made for them and thank you and goodbye and I'm going to make billions. So that is the difference um, and that's Canda Chocolates. And so right now we've had minis and we've had bars and we started with three flavors, extra dark, dark and milk. And I did that intentionally. We will add flavors in but I started with the basics because I, I needed people to taste the chocolate and say they like the chocolate. If you like the chocolate, I can add anything to it. But I needed people to, to really, for me to, to really call this a business and really, you know, put everything I have into it, I needed to know that people like the chocolate. So that's Canada Chocolates. I can attest to the fact it's some very good chocolate. I got the three pack and ate it up very quickly. <laughs> and now that you mention it, I got a order my resupply and I, we'll talk a little bit about next what you're what you're up to next and I'm sure as we lead into Valentine's Day mm -hmm. and maybe maybe we'll just go ahead and talk about now do you have any special plans for Valentine's Day for Valentine's Day um, I do it's funny this is very timely um, I do have a giveaway that I'm working on with other brands and I'm so excited to be able to launch that so that's upcoming and then I have some other brands that are picking up my chocolate in their packages. So you may see me, a can of chocolates in other places. Um, so that's what I have, you know, coming up for Valentine's Day. It, it's Valentine's Day is a balance. Um, and what I did last year, and you didn't ask this part, but I'm just sharing with you. I did um, a pieces and posted every day about Black love because I was trying to balance Black history with mm -hmm. Valentine's Day. And I was like, I, this is the best way I know. Let's talk about Black love every day. And I would just give examples of couples that exemplify what I thought is Black love. So that that's kind of you know how I've balanced it because I need to give, or I want to give equal footing to the fact that it's Black History Month, which is the shortest month of the whole year, and the fact that we're celebrating love. So it's kind of a mix of both. So I've got those two things planned. Good, a good idea. We're gonna have to follow you on social media yes, so that too. we can follow all the goodness and of the black love. Yes. I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing all that. Um, I also want to ask you about Macy's. Where, where are you in Macy's? Do you, which locations, which cities? Macy's is online. So Macy's is an online and we really, with the COVID, there are some brands to get into the stores, mostly clothing brands because of the fact of e-commerce being something that they're really trying to push from what they saw, people weren't going into the stores. And so e-commerce is really kind of where we're going to make our, our footprint. And I happen to love how my partnership with Macy's has gone. So a lot of people have discovered Canada chocolates just by going online. I'd love it to be where people will be able to go into the stores, but we also don't want the chocolate just to sit there when people don't know that it's in the stores. So I think it's a good opportunity to be able to grow the business with, you know, Macy's actually pushing the brand for us. Yeah. And so that makes it available everywhere. Correct. So that's, that's good. Yeah. So I'll have to go and check it out. There's a Macy's right across from me. I don't know if they let you pick it up there, but regardless, definitely got it on my list. <laughs> and I think, you know, since we're still in COVID, everyone's looking for a little pick me up Yes. as well. Yes. You mentioned everything is done in Ghana from the time you grow it to the production and then you're, you're, it's shipped over here. But it seems very complicated when I think about it. Like, I, you don't know the culture. You may not know the language. How did you make that a reality? I would say through relationships, trust, frustration, pulling my hair out. No, um, literally, it was a combination of all. Um, and I will say, even in doing business with Ghana, I also do business with China for some of the packaging and labeling. That being said, 
even then, you know, when I would talk to a man, sometimes they would refer me to a woman, they would find a woman that may not have even had the equal role just to speak with me culturally, right? So there's all these differences that you learn about doing international business. Um, so it really, truly took a lot of patience, a lot of praying, a lot of faith, um, because there was, because, and I also will say this, some things, this is not for the faint of heart, and that isn't to scare anyone. This, these are facts. Ghana is a cash-based business. It's not really, PayPal doesn't even work. You need to wire the money. Now, what if I wired the money and they were like, thanks and goodbye, who am I suing? Right, okay. So there was some trust that had to be built up, some experiences. Um, every time I wire the money, I get nervous because maybe they, maybe they would have experienced something due to COVID and they didn't tell me or anything like that. So it's been, you know, those few years of trust um, and then, you know, just looking towards the examples. But one thing they do know is how to grow cocoa beans. Um, they do know how to export cocoa. So it's not a far, it's not far off from what they're typically used to doing. And so is there any protection in terms of like if you use a PayPal or a credit, you can't do credit. Is there any protection? There's probably not a lot of protection. I'm just being honest. You probably can use PayPal if a business will accept it. Businesses I work with, we're talking, we're lo- you know, we're moving large amounts of money and it's a cash business. So you, you first need to, as a solopreneur, entrepreneur, which is what I am, bootstrapped solopreneur, my money goes towards the inventory, not as much towards the marketing and paying for paid ads and things like that. That's why, again... These being discovered on platforms like Amazon and Macy's make such a big difference. Again, not an ad. I feel like I'm talking an ad, but it's real talk. You need to place yourself in places where you can be found um, when you're trying to work with the bootstrapped. But those are those are some of the challenges. It's it's definitely not for the faint of heart. So before Macy's and um, all the opportunities that you mentioned, how did you go from you know starting a website to getting people to come to the website and to get them to start purchasing from you? So I'll, I'll, there's probably like two parts to that, right? So first was like laying the foundation. And one of the things that I wanted to do is when I had the available time, I wanted to get the certifications needed, like becoming minority or woman owned places that would get me exposure, right? So it's like free marketing. And then I also worked with making sure my FDA labeling, I wanted to make sure there wasn't anything that would get me pulled off a shelf or disqualified. So was I shelf ready? Did I have insurance? And I say all that, you know, for a lot of brands that are starting up and I buy a lot of stuff from different people and maybe it doesn't have a nutritional label or it, it, whatever, maybe it's some shea butter in a, in a container, you know, so I, if that's what you have to start with, get started. But for me, I had a little extra coming from corporate America and I put all my money into laying a foundation, you know, that saying about be ready, you know, being ready, get ready. Cause when it comes, it's going to come. And it did, it all hit like. People were like, why are you taking these professional photos, girl? What you doing with those photos? And I'm like, don't worry about it. Somebody's going to ask me for my headshot. What are you doing with this? So all those things, I laid the foundation. And then from there, I put myself in places where I could be found. And then I started doing tastings and showing up with different partners, right? Who can you partner with? So there was a whiskey brand that I partnered with to actually do some events with them. So we did that for like a year. Um, I did my own chocolate tasting when I hired, you know, had a wine sommelier give a pairing. So there was anything I could do, right? You put on that marketing hat, anything that you can do to get your brand out there and to start to get customers to try your product. Wow. It's smart plan. Cause I think a lot of people think about paid media. Were you working at the same time as you started the company? Did you start it part-time or did you just dive in? I dove in. Um, Only because I was at an inflection point in corporate America where it's either take a job moving again or stay here and launch this business. And I decided to stay and launch the business. So it definitely, but I did, but again, because I came from a background of corporate America, I had a savings, I had a 401k, you know, so I had all these things, pensions that, that actually are able to sustain me and I was able to use to invest in my business. That's like another good jump off point. Because these days, there's a little bit more fin- funding available for um, biopic um, entrepreneurs. And I know sometimes people are hesitant to take loans and to invest in their business. Do you have any advice about that? First, uh, I advise, let me back up. 
I've gotten, you know, I've gotten the Amazon grant the second round, right? It is still not easy to to do what some of us have been able to do. So there are steps to do it. So I, I don't even want to make it sound like it's easy because it's not. That's what I, I just want to make sure I'm empathizing and being real about the talk here. But that being said, for funding, I would definitely lean towards accelerators, grants. I mean, so you should be applying for any and everything that's coming across your screen. Even if you get told no 29 times, all you need is one time to get $10,000, one time to get $5,000. So some, maybe they're looking for something specific. Maybe this person isn't. Maybe this person's like, oh yeah, I want some chocolate. So it really just depends. I've noticed I've done pitches before um, through having my women's certification. They have pitches, you know, which is, the women's certification has paid itself off in, in I can't even explain, because they also have gotten me a lot of visibility. And so in doing so, those pitches, you can win money. So do everything you can that's free to get to the money. If you have to take out any type of funding, like from a loan, then you want to look for specific type of organizations that are supporting, you know, Black, you know, BIPOC businesses, things like that. So there is a listing of those types of businesses and you want to go through and kind of learn what those businesses are. And you want to make sure that they have a, some of them have backing by the small business associations. So things like that, but going to our large big box banks, listen, I, I mean, in my credit is over 800 or at least when I started my business, it was, I don't know, but either way um, I say all that to say is that even so that doesn't mean they're going to give you a loan, right? You have to have, the, the, it's that it's that funny part about starting a business, right? Where you have to have sold so much and proved yourself and have so much revenue to get the loan. But you're like, wait, but to get the loan, I need I need the loan. So it's it is it's a crazy which comes first, the chicken or the mouse. So I think that to your point, a lot of things have opened up. I think that going after them, doing the doing the grants, doing the pitches, all those things add up, and you should definitely make time. Don't just bury yourself down in your business. Business is just like corporate America and it's all about relationships and reaching out and, you know, and being able to connect with others and people talking about your brand. And that includes doing a pitch. Every single time I enter a grant contest, listen, they may or may not award me, but they've heard of Canda Chocolates. So that's, that's, uh, people come back to me and they say, oh, I was on the panel for so-and-so and I was really into your chocolate. You, you just have no idea what could happen. So you just have to keep putting yourself out there. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And so even though you might not have won the first pitch, you got your name out there. You might have came in second, you know. And so that second, that next time that you pitch, you already have a leg up. So it's so, it's so smart. Guess who else roots for you is other brands. When I do the pitch contest or whenever I'm on a panel with Amazon, I meet other business owners. Then they're like, hey, did you try this accelerator? Did you do this? Hey, I'm going to forward you this. And so I've gotten opportunities just from them emailing what they've had success from. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, there are so many accelerators out there. So are you a proponent of doing every, you know, as many accelerators that you can find or are you strategic? I think you should be strategic. There are some accelerators that are going to ask for equity up front. I would just be, I would caution depending on what your product is. If you have a novel product and you just haven't been discovered yet and you know it's novel, be careful about giving away that equity up front because that also turns off future investors. And also you weren't, you weren't worth as much at that time, but you may blow up. And now you got all this equity out to these people that you gave just to get five or $10,000. So there are a lot of accelerators popping up and they do require a equity as a part of your business in order to get signed up. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying read the fine print and decide if that's something for your business model. I've seen a lot of people with really innovative ideas and I just don't think that they should have to give up equity. You're just looking for the right investor at the right time. And you mentioned there is a list or you should seek out businesses that are supportive do you have any advice on how to find those businesses? Go through the small business association. That's one. You can go through your local small business association. Um, you can also go through the certifying bod bodies like women's owned certification or the minority owned certification. They have them as well. Um, I also use Hello Alice, right? And so that's one of the, and there's also, is it Fund Her or I Fund Her? I think it's I, I, I Fund, fund Her. her. Right? IFW, I yes, so. IFW. Yeah. but anyway, whatever, 
those are some of the resources that you can use um, to track down basically funding that's for small businesses, which is the key, that won't gouge you at rates that are higher than five, six percent. They really should be in the four percent range or lower, but you, that's something you want to keep an eye out for. Everyone will lend you money, meaning there is someone out there, but it could be at the rate of 30 percent. So if you're looking for people that you really want to partner with and get money from for the first time, Small Business Association will give you a list of banks that, that are willing to partner. Smart, good, good, good advice. Uh, thanks for sharing that. So I want to talk to you about what's, what has been the toughest part about being an entrepreneur. And we may have touched on it already, but if there's anything else that comes to mind. For me, I think it was something that I overcame, but I think the toughest part was trying to compare myself to other businesses or brands and seeing that they could do something. Why can't I do something? And oh my gosh, I haven't made this milestone. And it wasn't until like over a year into the process where I was like, wow, I was able to make it and I didn't take that path. And so the toughest thing for me was just, and it's like one of those cliche like sayings, like don't compare yourselves to other, you're competing with yourself, but it's so true. And so I think the toughest thing was trying to compete against anything that anybody else was doing. And you asked me a question about when I got started, did I do it on my own? And the answer is yes. However, I talked to all the, you know, after the fact, like two years in, I talked to all these business owners. Many of them have another spouse in the house. And I was like, wait a minute. So you're making it look, not, not that they were intentionally making it look easy, but it looked like I needed to compete with that when in fact I can't because you have something else funding your life and you only need to put your money back into your company. Well, I need money to come back and pay my salary. So there's, there's just two different things. And so when you're looking at another business, you really can't compare because you don't know what that person's story is, who was their funder. You're probably only getting pieces and parts of it. And so really taking that time not to compare yourself to other businesses, is, that was probably my worst enemy to getting started. A lot of the things that I hesitated on doing was all around comparison. And so just taking that hard lesson even though I knew it, I still did it. So once I stopped doing it, I, I found a lot more success. Mm -hmm. And probably a lot more peace. A lot more peace. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, in line with that, is there anything that you've experienced by being a Black woman entrepreneur, extra pressure or anything like that? I wouldn't say extra pressure. And, you know, coming out of the past two years while we had the viral pandemic, but we also had the racism pandemic <laughs> that hit ahead because the pandemic has been pervasive in the United States since its beginning. But that being said, I found that there's been a lot of support from everyone, from allies, from Black women. And, and I've really, really loved seeing that part. I mean, the only thing that, that has happened is whether or not someone's trying to relegate me and my brand to, oh, we're going to promote you during Black History Month. You know what I mean? Or, oh, we're going to put you on the African, you know, the ethnic aisle, things like that. All of those things. Or you have to be different. I've heard from a big box store, well, we have chocolate. How are you different? I thought, well, how are these other five brands different? You know, so things like that. So there's things that come up. I, I call those micro and macro aggressions that are really linked to an individual person that perhaps may work for that store. But that buyer may not be somebody that was very supportive, right? And so I just link those to individual people. But by and large, I've been more excited about the community of Black women that have been coming together that it kind of outweighs all of that. Now, is there an official community or is it the unofficial just saying? You unofficial. But it shows up in places. People recommend you. People, you know, find out about you. I'm looking out for them. I, there's all these things, all these businesses I didn't know about, honestly, until we hit this pandemic. So I would start, I live in Los Angeles, so I would be searching for black owners and it wasn't, but I, I needed other people were bubbling them up. And I'm like, how come I didn't know this store existed? How come I didn't know that was there? And I'm amazed. It's, it, I'm still amazed every single time I find out about a new brand. I, I'm, you know, I love my lotions, my body butters, you know, so it, it, you know, I'm always finding something and it just, and then they'll have like 15,000 followers. So what's, I didn't even know, right? How come I didn't know? But it's like everybody has these micro communities. So every single time I connect into somebody else's micro community, then I'm just blown away. So I do. I, I, 
I love it. And it's definitely not official, um, but it does. Now, a couple of last questions I wanted to ask you is you mentioned when you started, you did some due diligence. So you saw that chocolate, there, there was never a, a loss of sales in that category. Um, and you mentioned a couple other things, but uh, how important it is, is it to, for you to validate your idea before you get started? I think it's very important. It's very important. <sighs> I'm going to put this all, everything has a grain of salt to it, right? So it's important. But if you feel so strongly, have the time and the resources to push your idea all the way to the end, then do it. And, and, and so because whoever you validated with might be the end of 10 people and maybe there's 10 other people over here that are in love with your idea. So I never want to rain on someone's rainbow. You know what I mean? So it's literally if, if you have the time and the resources, if you don't, which would be my situation then yes, before I made an investment, right, and decided not to be in corporate America, I needed to know that I'd be able to sell the chocolate if it's good. Now, I, I knew it was good, right? And I had other people test it and they told me it was good, but will I be able to sell it? How am I going to get it off the shelf? Who's going to go and find it? What, you know, you can have great things and no one will take it off the shelf, right? There is, they always say it's hard to get in the store and harder to get off the shelf, right? And so, so many brands live and die on that first year they got into Target, and then that was it. All of that being said, I, you know, I definitely would just say that, you know, it's it's important to lay the foundation and to do the things if you can, and to follow your passion, but also to vet it. And I know I'm saying both, but I'm saying it both because if you have resources, then you know, run it out. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And then I also wanted to ask you about your team. So you mentioned, you know, apply for the grants. It's important to work in your business and not so much on, it's important to work on your business and not in your business. So can you tell us a little bit about your team? The team is me. The team is me. I knew, I knew that. <laughs> um, I just wanted to hear you say it. <laughs> I, I'm a solo bootstrapping entrepreneur. I did though, you know, hire a warehouse. So they are shipping the product for me. And so I consider them to be a part of my team. I do work with a female designer. I do work with a female photographer. So these are all what you call contract employees, but I still consider them a part of my team. And so that's been something that's been instrumental for me having success. Okay. And any plans to grow the team or are you pretty well um, staffed well, I definitely out right now? want to, you know, grow the team. The first thing is to just continue to see like another more year of revenue, really launch another product. And then, you know, once I'm at the point where I can have funding, um, that, that fun word of funding by somebody that I trust and somebody that can respect what Canada Chocolates is about and give back to the community and understand that we're putting people first. Um, once that happens, then I would decide to bring on more people. Yeah. And I think that uh, the culture is reflected by the, the leader of the organization. So since you have this uh, personality and interests and you know, desire to get back, it's definitely going to propagate down mm -hmm. to your organization once you start to grow. So no problem there. And yeah, look forward to seeing your growth and you. um, keeping in touch over the over this year, over 2022. Yes. Um, but I do want to ask you what's next? What's next for Canda? And what's next for Sage and Elms? So for Canda chocolates, we'll be launching some more flavors and maybe some cocoa adjacent products to come soon. So that's what's next for Canda Chocolates. And then for Sage and Alms, you know, we do have another brand. Um, and right now, you know, we the focus has been on Canda Chocolates. And so in the summer months, we kind of bring out Dew Burst a little bit. It, it kind of got a lot of hype during the pandemic. So we're just going to continue to focus on Canda Chocolates, but be open to bringing on other brands. Whether or not they are Cocoa adjacent and Findot or Canda, or if we launch another brand, that remains to be seen. So we'll see. But definitely more on the horizon. Mm. So it's going to keep you busy. And you mentioned you got some um, notoriety or some mentions with the Drew and, um, and Burst. So can you tell us a little about about that brand? So Drew Burst is, while I was launching Canda Chocolates, and, and by the way, when you're going through FDA labeling, trying to get everything right, all the certifications, because you don't want to print your label until you have everything that you want on it. So while I was going through that process, I... It was like, I, I literally got antsy and was like, I'm just going to launch something. What is something else I always wanted to do? And I, and I used to carry these wipes that I found in Asia. 
And I was like, I'm going to launch my own wipe and, and see how this does in the market. And so it's a dry to wet wipe. So it's, it's a coin size. You take it out. There's 10 in a pack and you take it out of the tube that I put it in and you add water and it turns into a hand wipe. Well, what's important is that when I was in Ghana, it's interesting when you go to Ghana, Europe, other places like that, and you stay in a hotel, and these are nice, it could be a Marriott, whatever, specifically more boutique hotels, but they may only give you one face towel and you may be there for seven days. And so going back up to my room, things like that, needing another face towel, sometimes they'd run out. Then the dew burst I would use for in my showers and to take, wash my hands and to wash my face. Then I started using it when I work out and then outside and then as a refresher and it just started taking off. And so I launched the dew burst, dew burst business so that I could actually put that out there. That's something that's environmentally friendly, that has no ingredients, no smells. People always ask me to put something in it. And I'm like, well, it's hypoallergenic for a reason. I want everyone to, you can put it on your dog, your kids, your baby's bottom. I want everybody to be able to use it. If I put something in it, I'm limiting and, and going back into a niche market. But all that being said, and it comes in a biodegradable tube. So it was my first foray with being environmentally conscious and launching a product under Sage and I. And, and you are truly blessed because what good timing. You said it took off during a pandemic when everybody was looking for one. Yes. So. Yep. Man, I, I need I need your kind of luck and blessings, <laughs> but uh, I'm sure it's a way to get that just by like, you know, saying our prayers and everything. Uh, but yeah, it's been great having you and we will definitely be checking you out on your website. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah.